Welcome everybody. I'm happy to introduce Shilan Azahawi as today's course lecturer, who will be giving us a practical tutorial on reproducible manuscripts. Shilan is a PhD student in organizational behavior at the Stanford Graduate School of Business and also a course affiliate. Shilan's research interests cover statistics, meta science, crowdsorted science, and Shilan has also been involved in the development of tools to improve the reproducibility of science. Shilan is also one of the 2021 recipients of the course Open Science Innovator Awards. And I'm happy to have Chilan here today as a speaker. Please join me in welcoming Chilan. Thank you so much, Armin. Um, I'm really excited to be here. So let me just set up my screen right here. Okay. If you can see that, give me a thumbs up. If you can't, an SOS. Thank you so much. Great. All right, so uh, thank you so much for that very kind introduction, Armin. I'm really excited to be speaking at CORS today. Like Armin said, I'm uh, very much interested in open science and an affiliate with CORS, so mm, um, really excited to be here. Today, I'll be talking about writing reproducible manuscripts in R. And uh, last week, Mike already gave a great conceptual talk about this topic. So today, I will be focusing more on the practical aspects. Now, an alternative title for this talk is Do Your Data Sci Like It's Going to Need an Alibi. So one day, if you will be put in front of the reproducibility judges, then all you will need to show them is your R markdown as your exhibit A, and they will have nothing further. Um, Franklin already posted the links to the slides in the chat. You can find them at bit.ly uh, slash shalon dash APA. So if you want to follow along, please feel free to do so. Um, so first, what I'll be doing today is giving a very brief conceptual introduction to the what and why of reproducible manuscripts. And then we'll spend the bulk of our time on the practical aspects of writing fully reproducible manuscripts. Um, and the practical aspects will be uh, covering two parts. The first part is an introduction to our markdown, which is a general framework for, uh, for authoring reproducible manuscripts. And the second part will cover papaya, which is specifically designed to write APA manuscripts. On the slides here, I'm also sharing a link to a GitHub repo with ex example manuscripts that you can take a look at. Um, you can look at it now or look at it later for future reference if you're inspired to get the things that I'll discuss today a try in one of your future projects. This repo includes a link to the slides and instructions for installing R or Studio and R Markdown and for cloning the contents of the repository to your local computer. Once you've cloned the contents of this repo, then you'll be able to follow along at your own pace and take a look at three fully reproducible manuscripts uh, generated with R Markdown. Uh, during this talk, I'll really start with the basics. So if you've already had some prior exposure to R and R Markdown, then you may want to start with the online materials on GitHub instead. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, so you may have already attended um, Mike Frank's talk last week, the conceptual talk on this topic, in which case you'll see some overlap in the workflow that I'm about to introduce and the personal experiences that Mike uh, discussed last week. So what is the typical workflow um, when we write scientific reports? In my experience, the typical workflow is to first do your analyses in some uh, form of software, uh, whether it be R, Python, SPSS, SAS, MATLAB, or Stata, and then to copy or uh, copy paste or otherwise save your graphs and results, and then to uh, open a program such as Microsoft Word to communicate these results. And once we've put copy pasted all these results into Microsoft Word, we're um, fully responsible for formatting these results and all the citations, the entire reference list, et cetera. Now, one thing that I'd like you to think about as I present this typical workflow is what are some common challenges that arise when you work in this fashion? And what are some problems that could arise? Um, of course, feel free to comment in the chat or if you wanna share any of your thoughts or your horror stories. Um, in the meantime, I'll just uh, share a nice little clip. Let me make sure that I'm sharing my sound. All right.
Great. So I really like uh, showing that clip because I think it really contrasts the two workflows that we'll be talking about today. One is kind of the traditional workflow that I just introduced. And the other one is the alternative workflow that we hope to um, to get you to uptake after this talk, which is a, a more open and reproducible form of working and writing your final manuscripts or your reproducible manuscripts. Um, and here's another image that I think portrays one of the issues that comes with this workflow, which is, of course, endless uh, different versions of the same file. Um, so let me just bring up um, and summarize some of these work, uh, challenges that come with this workflow. So first of all, of course, it's very time consuming to have to work um, through a certain software and copy and paste results and then get them into a different um, software. There's time related to transcribing, copy pasting, formatting your references, fixing the layout of your document after you've added another table or figure in Word. There's time related to tracking down your mistakes or other sources of differences when you all of a sudden get a different results when you rerun your analysis. All in all, it's just a very time consuming workflow. Now, a second uh, challenge that comes with this workflow is, of course, that it is more um, error prone. So you can make, if you're manually copy pasting or transcribing, then you can make transcription errors, you can make uh, rounding errors. And I think this is something that came through very clearly in uh, Mike Frank's talk last week, which is the prevalence of statistical re reporting errors in psychological science and probably many other sciences as well. A third challenge that I want to point out is that it lacks transparency. It is very difficult to reproduce, uh, not only by yourself, but also by other people who may want to uh, reproduce your work. It is also very difficult to maintain and update. So this goes back to that picture that I just shared of the endless different versions that you may have when you're rewriting and uh, reformatting your paper. Um, this, of course, comes from having multiple inconsistent versions of your code, your data, your writing, or all of the above. And there's overhead costs uh, involved with um, moving between different computing and software environments. If there's anything else that comes to mind for you, uh, please feel free to put it in the chat and we can always discuss it at the end uh, during Q&A. All right, so let's talk about the alternative workflow that I'll be interested in introducing today. So first, a very brief uh, conceptual introduction. This alternative workflow is one in which you fuse your code and your writing, and um, your results are directly embedded in your report. So if you change something about your code, then the underlying writing automatically changes along. And um, any analytic changes will be automatically reflected in your documentation. And something that's really helpful as well is that you can update all your results, your figures, and your tables uh, automatically. And this includes automatic formatting, even of your uh, citations and reference list. Now, I think this has become already quite clear um, given uh, the talk that you may have attended last week, but why do we want to uh, take up this workflow? Well, it's less error prone. Um, one of the rationale behind reproducible manuscripts is error detection and mitigation. Um, a reproducible report is just easier to audit. And because we avoid manual tasks like copy pasting, we reduce opportunities for error. It is also less time consuming. Um, if you've attended some of the other talks in this lecture series, you've heard uh, Maya, Percy, and Mike all discuss efficiency in their talks. So there's, of course, a steep learning curve at first when you invest in reproducible uh, research practices, but it is immensely time saving in the long term. Um, for instance, in the case of reproducible manuscripts, it's much easier to um, build on your prior work by, re by reusing your code, and there's no need to start from scratch each time um, or to remind yourself of what you did previously. So for instance, let's say you submit a paper to a journal and it comes back for an r, &R. At that point, it will be so much easier to add a covariate or to add some other robustness check that your reviewers are asking for without having to completely start from scratch in a um, drag and drop kind of manner. This alternative workflow is also uh, more dynamic uh, more reproducible and more transparent for yourself and others. Uh, like Maya said in her talk on conceptual, uh, conceptual talk on reproducible data analysis, 
um, investing in reproducible practices doesn't just benefit other people, it benefits your future self. It's an investment in your future sanity. So let's move on to the practical uh, aspect. Our weapon of choice today will be R Markdown. R Markdown is an authoring framework for data science, and it is specifically designed for reproducibility. With R Markdown, the same document holds your code and the pros surrounding the data, and the results are automatically generated from the code. You can use a single R Markdown file to save and execute your code and to generate high quality reports that can be shared with an audience. So let's move on to the introduction to our markdown. So like I said before, with our markdown, you can create dynamic analysis documents that combine uh, your code, your output, including your figures and your tables, and your writing. So a dynamic sci scientific report interleaves the written report with blocks of code used to conduct the analysis, and the text is automatically formatted as a scientific uh, paper in several potential styles that you can uh, choose from. When the result, when the text is formatted, the code blocks are evaluated and their results are inserted in the text or rendered as figures and tables. And dynamic uh, document generation replaces this cl classical approach of using separate programs to write pros and conduct analyses and then manually copy pasting the analysis results into the text. So when your revisions require major changes to the analyses, then all results, figures and tables are automatically updated. And um, there's a large flexibility in output formats as well. So you can render your manuscript as a PDF, a Word document, or even to a poster, a website, or a blog post. So like I said, our markdown can be used to reproduce your analyses, collaborate and share your code with others, and communicate your results with others. The output formats are very flexible. They include HTML, PDF, and Word, but you can also create slideshows. Um, the slideshow that you're looking at right now is created in our markdown. Uh, websites, blogs, books, your CV, dashboards, um, interactive documents or shiny apps, conference posters, and of course, um, what we're talking about today, manuscripts. So here's a um, little sneak peek of the power of R Markdown. Here on the left, you see my R Markdown document. Um, specifically, what you see is the front matter or the metadata that is written in YAML, which I'll talk about uh, later. You see that I defined some uh, metadata here, including the title, the author, the institution, uh, some keywords, etc. And then to your right over here, you see the uh, Word manuscript that is created from this metadata, uh, metadata, and it is formatted in APA format, which is the format that uh, psychologists and behavioral science, scientists tend to use. Um, you see here that it looks uh, the way that I expect my manuscript or a psychologist expects their manuscript to look like with a, with a title, uh, an author, a an author note, et cetera. And um, what I just showed you was a sneak peek of the metadata and the resulting title page. Here's a little sneak peek of what it looks like when uh, you write your prose in R Markdown. So the text itself uh, with some references um, in there as well. And to your right, you see the R Markdown uh, generating the Word document over here. And as you can see here, I'm using a citation key. And over here, it's the formatted site. And a uh, final sneak peek is of uh, the acknowledgments that you can write at the end. So one nice thing to do is when you use other people's software for uh, making your workflow more reproducible and, and less time consuming, less error prone, is to acknowledge those people that have made this possible. So I, I always like um, citing the software I've used and the art packages I've relied on at the end of the manuscript. And this you can do automatically. What you see here is a setup chunk in which I load certain R packages by referring to library and the name of the package. Um, I use a command uh, R underscore refs to create um, a bibliography with my R references. And then I can use inline code um, later on in the manuscript to cite those packages. Now, one thing I'd like for you to think about for a second, and I would definitely like to dedicate time at the end of this talk to discuss this, is if there are any good reasons for not using R Markdown for um, writing, your rep uh, writing a reproducible manuscript. 
One thing I've already discussed is that there's, of course, a steep learning curve involved. Another is, of course, um, that there are barriers to collaborating with others. Not everyone will be uh, experienced with the tools that it requires to write reproducible manuscripts, whether it be R, R Studio, or Markdown, or even if you want to use version control, Git and GitHub. And another um, barrier that you may have when you uh, specifically use very big data is that our markdown files itself are not the best format for computationally expensive functions in the sense that they um, that they knit more slowly. Um, they run less fast than a normal R script, but there are of course ways to overcome this. So if this uh, any of these um, limitations apply to you and you want to discuss them, please reach out to me or feel free to bring it up at the end of the talk. All right, so let's get into getting started with our markdown. So what you'll want to do is um, install R and R Studio. And um, in the slides that you can open online, these links are clickable. And note that if you do open the slides yourself, you, you may notice that it takes a minute or so to load because these uh, slides are quite large. But um, if you just give it a minute, it should be fine. So what you'll want to do is install R and R Studio if you haven't already done so, and install the R Markdown package. And for generating output to PDF documents, one additional thing you'll need is a distribution for LaTeX, uh, for instance, uh, TinyTech. And uh, the way to get these last two things is by running uh, these three lines of code. So installing the R Markdown package and TinyTech and um, another command to install TinyTech into RStudio. Now here's a little uh, GIF of how you can open a new R Markdown. Uh, once you've installed the R Markdown package, in our studio itself, when you open our studio, all you have to do is go to file, new file, our markdown, and then you'll see uh, a neat little document like that created. And our markdown provides a notebook interface. What that means is that you'll have the direct interaction with R. You can ex execute your code and display the results in line. So if I write a, a line of code here and I click this little green run button, then I get the result right below the chunk. And this makes it really easy to test and iterate when you're working in an R Markdown document. And um, like I said before, R Markdown produces a reproducible document with publication quality output. There are three types of content in an R Markdown document. The first is the YAML metadata. I already briefly mentioned this. Uh, this is also uh, called the front matter. It's everything that you see here in between the three dashes. So here, my metadata is simply um, a title, an author, a date, and the output that I specify. The second element that you'll find in our markdown document is the text that you see right here. And this text uses markdown formatting. And I'll give a brief introduction to markdown formatting very soon. And the third type of content, of course, is R code. So this is where the magic comes in, is that within the same document, you can write code and, um, and write the text surrounding the code. So I'll first briefly discuss the metadata. Um, the YAML header contains basic metadata and rendering instructions. So here I specify the title, author, output, and date. But what you can also do instead of manually writing this date out and having to change it each time um, you re-knit the document, we wanna automate our tasks as much as possible. So you can also write a line of code to dynamically update the date every time that you knit the report. And you can do that with the help of one line of code in the, in the metadata. So after date, you can between quotation marks and back ticks write R sys.date. So here I specify with inline code which, which language um, the R Markdown document should rely on. And then I use the command sys.date to generate um, a document with today's date. You can also, when you're working in R, preview the R Markdown. And you can see in the GIF here that you just click on the small little wheel and you can either preview it in an outside window um, like this 
or you can preview it in your viewer pane right here to the right of the console. Uh, rendering a document um, is also called knitting the document, and you can do that by clicking the knit button, the tiny little um, blue ball of yarn here, or you can use a shortcut um, on OS X, that's command plus shift plus K. And like I said, there are different output formats. Now, the way you can specify your output format is by writing uh, writing it out here in the metadata in the YAML front matter, but there are also other ways. You can, for instance, click on the little arrow here next to knit and uh, choose a different output format, or instead of um, doing everything manually, you can write a line of code that uh, specifies, uh, that uses the command render, and within this function specifies the name of the R Markdown document and which output format you'd like it to do. So if I run this uh, line of code, then to the right here, you see that it generates a Word document. So what's happening behind the scenes when you knit an R Markdown document is that um, the code is first executed and converted into an MD file. And this MD file is then converted to the output format specified in the metadata. So this um, has some consequences. When you knit an R Markdown file, this starts a completely new R session with no packages or objects loaded. And it sets your working directory to the location of the R Markdown file, which means that you do not, like in a usual R script, have to set your working directory. It also executes all the code chunks from top to bottom. As a consequence, you have to make sure that you load all the R packages before you use them. And the best place to do this is to have a setup chunk. So your very first line of code in which you uh, load all the R packages that you use. And this is, of course, also optimal for reproducibility in the sense that other people who download your code can immediately see what R packages you rely on and which they may need to download themselves. All right, so let's move on to the code element of an R Markdown document. There are two types of code in R Markdown. Uh, the first one is a code chunk, and you can see a code chunk here. It's, it has a gray background and is surrounded by three backticks and um, curly braces and um, specifies which language, in this case, R. And you also have inline code expressions. Those are surrounded by one backtick and R right here. So let's first talk about code chunks. Code chunks are really what it's all about uh, when you write a reproducible manuscript. So this, for instance, is, an, is a code chunk where I specify, give me the summary of this data frame. And you can insert a code chunk by, again, using uh, shortcuts like Control-Alt-I on Windows or Command-Option-I on OS X, or simply by writing it out and enclosing your code with three backticks and, and curly braces and uh, referring to the language that you want to use. Uh, so I'm not sure I've said this specifically, but you can also use other languages in your R Markdown document. So you can use Python, uh, Bash, or anything else. There's also um, a simple button that you can click to start up a new code chunk. It's green and has a C and a plus in it. Here's a little uh, graphic that shows it. So here you see us creating an R Markdown chunk, an R code chunk. Now the anatomy of the chunk is um, we have the backticks that open and close the chunk and we have uh, chunk properties that we can specify within those curly braces. Um, so for instance, here, the property that is set is echo equals false, which means do not print this code in uh, the generated document. Do not echo the code, just give me the results. Um, and you also can give your uh, code chunk a name. Here, the name is pressure. Uh, you can specify the code language. Um, and I think that is it. So naming your code chunk is recommended. Um, it allows you to quickly navigate your code and automatically name your figures and troubleshoot any errors. So for instance, if you're knitting your document and something goes wrong, then uh, the name of the uh, code chunk that caused the error will be printed to your console. 
And here you also see in the GIF that we can jump between different um, elements of the document by clicking on the name of the chunk. In terms of the chunk options, um, this is quite important to generating a reproducible report. Um, you can control a chunk's behavior by passing additional comma separated um, arguments. The default is equal equals true, which means that in the generated document, in the generated report, both your code and your output will be shown. Now, usually this is not what you want when you're writing up a manuscript to submit to a journal. You don't necessarily want to show the code unless you're writing a manuscript in which you're teaching something code related. So you'll want to set echo uh, to false to show only the output and hide the code. Um, there's certain um, there's certain chunks where you might not want to um, show the output either, but you do want to run the code. So this applies, for instance, to the setup chunk that I that I talked about. You will have to uh, load all your R packages, but you don't necessarily want to show the output of that setup chunk. So there you'll want to um, set include equals false. So this slide shows some more options, including turning off uh, warning messages, error messages, or any messages. There's also, um, when you set up an R chunk, there's a little wheel um, and you can manually specify these options. It'll give you some options, including whether you wanna show the warnings or use page tables, use custom figure size, et cetera. Now, in terms of executing your uh, chunks when you're working in your R markdown, you can uh, press the green arrow or uh, use control plus enter or command plus enter, depending on what device you are on. To insert your inline code, you can wrap your code in a single backtick. And what inline code, uh, why it's different from an, an, a code chunk is that for inline code, R markdown will always display the results uh, display the results, but not the code. So in a way, echo is always set to false and it will apply the relevant text formatting to the results. So I'll show you a quick example here. Here I have my R markdown uh, document where I'm writing out a sentence. To avoid copy pasting, we can execute R code in line using backticks, for instance, M equals. And here um, I have my inline code uh, between backticks and um, R, I asked for the mean of a data set called sleep and specifically a variable called extra. And I know that this should yield M equals 1.54. Now, when I knit it, this is what the knitted HTML document looks like. And here you see that exactly what I expected was generated in line. Now off to the text of an R markdown. So like I said, um, R markdown uses markdown formatting. Um, you can italicize your text with, with uh, asterisks or underscores. You can make your text bold. Uh, you can include links and you can also rely on LaTeX for equations, which I've found very helpful. And I will also be discussing today how you can add uh, sites. So here's a quick overview of the syntax and what they become. One important uh, element here to note is the headers. So if you want a, a title, for instance, refer to methods or results, then you use a single pound sign. Um, and if you use two pound signs, that will automatically be uh, seen as a um, as header two and formatted in the way required by the journal that you're submitting to. I'm including here on the slides a link for more formatting options that you can take a look at. Now, one aspect that's really nice about our markdown is that you can also uh, knit tables. And I will be giving you an example of APA tables later on. Uh, but another, uh, some other packages that are often used to make really nice tables in R are Xtable and Stargazer um, and Cable. So some tips and tricks when it comes to R markdown, make sure that you load all your R packages in the first code chunk. Uh, in any case, even if you don't do it in the first code chunk, do it before you run the code that relies on the package. Otherwise your document will not knit. 
Uh, do not include install dot packages um, or set working directory. That is not uh, desired behavior when you're working in a markdown document. There's also um, an element that's really helpful for when you're writing manuscripts, um, the ability to check your spelling. So there's an, a spell checker in um, our studio. And so you can just click on the um, little button that says ABC and uh, make sure that your spelling is checked. And there's also some cheat sheets and great references within our studio that you can rely on by following uh, these hyperlinks. So I'll move on to Papaya right now. Um, Papaya is an R package that stands for preparing APA journal articles. Now, if you do not submit to APA journal or to, to APA journals, no need for despair because there are many other packages out there to help you write a fully reproducible report in the style of your choosing. Um, if this applies to you, I suggest taking a look at the R package articles without an A. Um, articles includes templates for a wide variety of formats and journals, including those required by Elsevier, Frontiers, PLUS, PNAS, Sage, Springer, and Taylor and & Francis. So let's uh, take a look at APA now. I've already shown you this um, sneak peek of an APA title page. And here's a sneak peek of what an APA table will look like. So what I have here is a data frame called DF. And in that data frame, I have some um, data on people's uh, self-reported well-being, their religiosity, their age, their gender, their socioeconomic status, and their education. And I'm interested in running a uh, linear regression where I uh, predict overall well-being from the variables uh, that I just mentioned. So here I uh, create a model um, with this linear, uh, I create an object called mod one, where I run this linear model. And then I use APA print, APA underscore print to um, turn this into an APA linear model. And I use the APA underscore table um, argument from the Papaya package to print uh, an APA table with the results. And what I get when I run these three lines of code is this. So uh, no more need to write out manually your all your estimates, 95% confidence intervals, uh, T values, P values. We can see here that uh, this table is exactly formatted in the way that we would like it to be. Uh, the P values are even formatted in the way that we'd expect them in the sense that when it's uh, less than 0.001, it gives you exactly that, less than 0.01, but if it's more than that, then we get the exact p-value with three decimals. The way to get started with Papaya is to um, install first DevTools, which is, or remotes, which are two packages that you can use to install from uh, GitHub. And then you run this second line of code to install the package from, uh, from GitHub. Now, after you've installed this package, uh, you'll have a new functionality in our studio, which is that you can navigate to file, new file, R markdown. And under templates, you'll now have a new template added to our studio, which is called APA article. Um, and like I said, if you want to knit some other format, then um, download the R package articles, and then you'll see a bunch of different templates appear as well that. Um, you can choose from. So this is what um, this looks like. I would now like to introduce uh, APA citations and how that works. So the way to get started with APA citations, um, you'll wanna download a reference manager. I would um, recommend Zotero because of its uh, very convenient integration with R and R Studio and specifically the Papaya package. After you've downloaded Zotero, then um, you can download uh, an extension called Better BibTech for Zotero. This extension allows you to name your own site keys and comes with um, additional functionality. And um, 
Lastly, you'll want to install CiteR. This is an RStudio add-in to insert markdown citations. And CiteR can directly access your reference database and keep your reference file updated. And it comes with a really nice uh, functionality as well that I'll show you in just a second. The way to install it is also to use DevTools um, and to install from GitHub. The way to insert your citations is to first create a reference file using a reference manager. Like I said, in this case, I would recommend Zotero. And then to supply this reference file in the front matter. So I've shown you what the front matter looks like. You can um, include a line that refers, uh, that starts with bibli bibliography and then refers in between quotation marks and square brackets to the name of your bibliography. And you'll have to have this reference file in the right location. That is where your R markdown file is located as well. And then the third step is to insert citations. You can insert citations in uh, different ways. One is simply uh, manually by inserting uh, using your citation key. So you can open Zotero and take a look at what the citation key is. Um, you can change this key if you'd like, or now that you've installed Cite R, you can um, use the add-in. And that add-in, you can just uh, in RStudio, click on add-ins, insert citations. And then you'll have just have a nice looking um, um, square pop up like this, and you can search the references and click the one that you prefer that you'd like to add. The nice thing about using this add in is let's say I now click on your Kony um, and add this reference, then this add in will automatically write this citation to the reference file. So it will update uh, the reference file that you're using that you've put into your, um, into your RStudio project location. Um, I'm including here a table that shows you how to insert citations. So you can insert, insert citations with, uh, within parentheses, uh, multiple citations. The nice, things, uh, nice thing about inserting multiple citations is that they're also automatically sorted alphabetically. Um, you can use in-text citations or only refer to the year, write prefixes and suffixes as well. And like I said, in the beginning of the talk, you can cite R packages too using R underscore refs to create a bib tag file uh, that has references to all the packages that you've currently loaded. Now here's a quick example of what it looks like to harness the power of metadata, code, and text. Here in my R Markdown document, I have a code chunk in which I'm running a, uh, a power t-test. So I'm checking what the power is uh, or what, what the required sample size is for a t-test where I want to de detect an effect, a standardized mean difference of 0 0.5 at a significant level, significance level in alpha of 0.05 with a power of 80%. And it's a two sample t-test um, and it's one-sided. So I run this little chunk right here and I create an object called n underscore fixed. And this object has the uh, exact number of participants that I would need. And here I run, um, I under that chunk, I write some text. Um, I, you can see here that I've italic italicized the T and the D and I use LaTeX to have ni nice formatting to refer to the null hypothesis and to Delta, the standardized mean difference. And uh, the best part is of course over here where I have the inline code uh, where I say that this test would require and then between parentheses or between backticks uh, referring to the object that I just created. So this means that if I decide later on that, you know what, I don't want 80% power, I would like more power, I want 90%, I, and I um, change this number over here, then automatically this number, this object will be updated and the text that uh, will be generated will automatically be updated. So here you see what it looks like when I knit this. Um, and as you can see, apparently we need 51 participants per group. It's a lot of effort saved for me. I never actually had to uh, run this code manually and check what the answer is and figure out that it's 51. Um, 
the whole knitting process takes care of it for me. Here's an example of statistical output. Uh, again, the same uh, linear regression model that I told you about before. And um, now I'm writing out uh, the estimate for religiosity is, and between uh, backticks, I'm asking for the estimate of religiosity from the APA underscore, underscore LM object. And this is what's knitted. So I get the estimate, the coefficient estimate, and a 95% confidence interval formatted in exactly the way that we would like it to be. Now, I've already showed this APA table, so I will move on. Um, in terms of Papaya, some tips and tricks. You can define a keyboard shortcut for inserting citations. Uh, I myself use Command Shift R to insert citations. Uh, you can do this uh, by browsing your add-ins and uh, going to Cite R and then Keyboard Shortcuts. I would also recommend using the Papaya manual. And there are also a lot of papers that are written with Papaya. So you can simply download um, their source code and take a look at what it looks like and learn a lot from that. And I, of course, also hope that the GitHub um, page that I shared with the three example manuscripts um, will provide a good resource there as well. So I, this was the end of my introduction to writing reproducible reports, but I'd love to open it up for questions. One thing I'll, I will say is that if I had more time, I would have also discussed version control with Git and GitHub, which I think is really useful, um, is really a great way to combine uh, both the R Markdown and Papaya aspect with making sure that you can track your changes and um, um, track them over time. And uh, another way to make your work even more reproducible is to make your software environment reproducible as well. For instance, uh, using RN for Groundhog or Docker. So in the chat, I'll be posting uh, links to two papers that can further help you on your journey to reproducible research with R. And that also discuss on top of the tools that I discussed today, uh, version control and reproducible uh, software environments. All right, I see that we have something in the chat, so I'll stop sharing and take a look at the chat. Okay, I see that's that's Franklin um, sharing the readings. Great. Maybe why people um, collect questions for the Q and A. Um, first of all, thank you for the great talk. It was super interesting. I really enjoyed it. I'm, um, of course, a big fan of reproducibility, and I'm always looking for kind of ways to apply these concepts to my own work. And I have like a, a question I think that you touched upon a bit already in your talk. So I work in a field where I do a lot of work that is more computationally intense. And now the question is, do you have any tips or recommendations, for example, for workflows for um, people doing more computationally intense um, work? Yeah, great question. Thanks. Um, I think that's a great question. Uh, it's relevant to my own work as well. So just today I was writing a paper for which I'm writing a bunch of simulation and the resulting data frame is even like too big to commit to GitHub. So I will first have to zip it, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, the way I do it for that project, so that project, I also use the same tools that I talked about today is I um, write the underlying simulations or any kind of data generate generating function in an R script. And uh, then I source in the results in my R markdown. So only the, the resulting objects. Um, and I, I think um, Mike touched on this last week also a little bit, like modularizing everything and making sure that the R markdown really only reads in the results, I think would be a great way to deal with that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I think that is also was my intention also that it make, yeah. makes more sense for you to read out um, results rather than computing everything in the, in the script. Um, maybe I can ask another question. There's nothing in the Q&A. So another thing that is, so I think working with multiple collaborators on a project, you this is something you also mentioned in your talk, you're often confronted with um, or you work with people who are less tech savvy, who have less experience, for example, in Markdown or LaTeX or in, in GitHub. And do you have any tips or recommendations for how maybe this, this um, process, this workflow can be made more approachable for people who are less um, tech savvy? 
Yeah, first I'll say, I think for me, this is the biggest challenge right now uh, in working with reproducible manuscripts. I have not fully figured out yet how to work with co-authors in um, with reproducible manuscripts. So I'll say that first, that's like me admitting that it's just not perfect yet. I know there's certain people working on tools. Um, I've heard of Curve Note, for instance, I believe, uh, where they're really trying to not just have the R markdown functionality, but make it um, interactive uh, for co-authors to just track, uh, make comments and track changes and do things like that. So I'm really excited to see that develop further. In the meantime, the way I've dealt with it, and I'll admit that this is certainly not perfect, is um, when I work with a co-author who tends to just make comments anyway, I just sent them the generated Word document and I ask them to make comments there, get the comments and then um, have them on one, you know, on one screen while on the other screen I, I update my R markdown document and, and incorporate their comments, which is pretty similar to getting comments on a Word document and then working in the Word document to incorporate uh, their suggestions. It's of course a shame when you have a co-author who's, who's, who wants to be more, um, collaborative in the sense that they don't just want to make comments, but they actually want to make changes to the document. In that case, um, I think it is pretty doable to explain, to send an R markdown file and maybe to have a first meeting before you do that, um, where you show them the R markdown file and very clearly show, look, this is the aspect that holds the text. So if you want to change the text, then the, the, this is where you can do that. Um, I think it's pretty clear in an R markdown file, at least, you know, our code chunks tend to have a gray background and the text looks just like, um, just like normal text. So I think that's pretty doable to teach your collaborators or it's not even teaching, it's just showing them where they can make changes to the text if they would like to, um, and maybe even tell them to knit it if they if they want um, and give it a try. And who knows, that might be a way to get them on board too. Uh, but I will admit that I, I haven't tried this out yet and I'm not sure uh, to what extent um, certain collaborators would be open to it. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Maybe I have one more question, but maybe I give people a bit of time uh, to see if someone else has a question from the audience. I think they're opening up the floor for you, Armin. Go for it. Um, okay, so now I need to get my thoughts. Um, so one hurdle I think that, I, that one is often confronted with when submitting papers or journals, manuscripts to journals is that journals can have very different um, standards for how they want the paper to be, the manuscript to be formatted. For example, some journals want um, editable, like a, actually like a doc file, others want a PDF, others want a, a latex file. Do you have any um, experience and tips for converting between different um, formats with Papaya, for example, or with um, R Markdown? Yeah, I've actually found that to be uh, relatively straightforward. So for instance, if you knit to a PDF with R Markdown, you can automatically get the underlying LaTeX document as well. So uh, that's something that you can automatically incorporate into your workflow is that you knit to a PDF and a LaTeX at the same time. You will find that um, sometimes not everything is compatible in the sense that um, PDF allows for a little bit more functionality, for instance, than Word. Um, it's just easier to communicate like from, um, from our markdown to a PDF document to, than to a Word document. But overall, I've had very positive experiences with uh, knitting to, to different formats, yeah. Then maybe I have one last question. Um, maybe a more general question, like what are, are there any challenges that you see in these kinds of workflows that you haven't touched upon yet that you would like to or think that you think are worth mentioning or have you um, covered everything? No, yeah, I definitely haven't covered everything. Um, you know, one thing I'd like to say is that my solutions and the solutions I pr 
presented today, they're definitely not perfect. Uh, but I always think that some solution is better than no solution. Like you have to start somewhere. Um, and I think this is a great start uh, towards making your manuscripts uh, reproducible. Um, and to maximize uptake, I personally believe that it's also important to strike a balance between rigor and ease of use. So um, the most rigorous solution would, of course, also include Git and GitHub. It would also include fully reproducible software environments, for instance, using Docker. And honestly, there's no way for us to look into the future, but 10, 20 years from now, there might be other uh, limitations to, to reproducibility that I'm not even aware of while, while I'm presenting today. So I think um, two things that I would like to add to this talk if uh, people feel so inclined is definitely use version control with GitHub. And if you want to also add a, a reproducible software environment on top of that. Um, but I would say that this is a great place to start. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. I think there's a trend where um, these kind of interactive or reproducible um, computational manuscripts become more common. Elife, I think, has a format now that is very similar, I think, to our markdown. We actually can write a manuscript and place code in the middle, and people can explore both. So yeah, I'm also excited to see where things will move in the next next few years. I actually also have a question for you, Armin, because I know that you tend to um, code in Python more so than yeah. our markdown. Are there similar, maybe for people in the audience who use Python, uh, would you say there's sim there similar functionality? Um, what do you, you do to make your manuscripts reproducible? Yeah, I have to admit, this is something I've never found a way of, um, I've never, okay, I've never invested a lot of time in exploring a workflow for making a manuscript reproducible. It's always something that is on my mind that I would like to do, but I kind of haven't gotten around to doing it. So I'm really intrigued. Like I have been during the talk, I've been trying to figure out, okay, how can I do this um, best working in another programming language that is not R and I think, one way of doing it might be to have scripts that um, compute all my analyses and then just read out um, the outputs actually in R, for example. I can still write a manuscript in R and just have very simple functions that take that read out my computed um, result files and then put this in the manuscript. So I think this could be one way, one way of doing it. But yeah, I haven't figured it out yet. Yeah, that's great. And there's, of course, also the option of uh, just writing Python code in, R, in your R markdown file. So yeah. And then hopefully one day you will move completely to the dark side and join us. <laughs> All right, I see a question in the Q&A. Is R Markdown like Jupyter Notebook or are they different from each other besides language? That's a great question. I get asked that a lot. I personally do not use uh, Jupyter Notebook. Um, Armin, you do, right? Um, yes, I have been using Jupyter Notebook, but I haven't been using R, R um, Markdown a lot. So. I can, I can, it, I think Jupyter Notebook is more focused on guiding someone through your code and making the code kind of interactive and it's less, um, the, the goal is not to produce a manuscript in the end. So it has a different purpose, I think. Is there a functionality in Jupyter Notebook to, to like generate a PDF or generate a work document or something like that? So Jupyter Notebooks can, so Jupyter Notebooks have a very classical notebook format where you have different cells which can run code and then you see the output rendered below. And you can um, export the whole Jupyter Notebook as it looks to an HTML file or a PDF, for example. They are, so by itself, there's no functionality to make something a paper, but there are other um, approaches for doing this. There are um, there's software, for example, that allows you to write books and papers. I think books is the focus. It's called Jupyter Books where you can um, write a document in a Jupyter style, and then it gets exported to a um, book format. So it gets formatted in that way. So yeah, that tools for this, but Jupyter Notebook by itself, I think does not have the same functionality. Um, we have another question. Thank you, by the way, Armin, for addressing that. Uh, Catherine um, says, great presentation. Thank you. Do you have a sense of the uptake of R Markdown or even R, R Studio among students? I'd love to use it in my teaching, but it might be hard to teach others on how it works while uh, learning myself. I have, I have several thoughts on this question. Uh, very happy to hear that you're you know, interested in using it in your teaching. I would say one really important thing to point out is that R Markdown, R and R Studio, as specifically R Studio and R Markdown, have a great community online. So sometimes um, 
it helps to not even invest in reinventing the wheel and creating new resources, but pointing to already existing resources. And there really are tremendous resources out there now uh, for teaching the basics of R Markdown. Um, I will also say I've seen an increase in the uptake of R Markdown and R Studio time. So if I look at my own department, I'm in the organizational behavior uh, department at the Graduate School of Business, um, all the students use R now, not all faculty do. So you can see that over time, you know, in our teaching, uh, we get taught by the psychology department as well. And they're completely moving to teaching statistics um, using, using R instead of SPSS, which is what we used to rely on. So I definitely see more momentum for it. I think it will only increase in the in the years to come. Speaking from my field personally, well, Catherine, I know that you of course know a lot about the replication crisis, et cetera, as well. I think there is a little bit of a pressure out there to make sure that your work is more reproducible and one way to start, um, start getting that ball rolling is by um, learning, learning R and R Markdown instead of drop down languages that make it more difficult for people to reproduce your work. So I, I have seen great uptake among students. Among faculty, I think less so for, for understandable reason. There's less of an incentive to learn new software um, after you know years of relying on something that's worked for you. So Armin, do you have anything to add to that? No, oh, that sounds, yeah, everything has been said, I think. Um, yeah, I would maybe we are at the time limit right now, I think. So I think we can end it if there's no more question. There's something in the chat. Okay. Yeah, otherwise, it was uh, really a great talk. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. This was really great. And to everyone in the audience, um, if you ever want to uh, talk about this or anything, please feel free to reach out. <laughs>